But don't worry, my grandparents were from the north of England. I can get away with that stuff. <laughs> we have to come back to the temple in a few moments. Things in the Bible that teach us about the tribulation. Pay attention. Look at this Second Thessalonians chapter 2. We request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Yeshua HaMashiach and our gathering together to Him, that you may not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed by either a spirit, a message, or a letter as it were from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasia, the falling away, comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as God. Now again, on the Antichrist tapes, we deal with this. It's Isaiah, it's Ezekiel, it's Satan wanting to be worshipped as God, like the king of Babylon, etc. Do you not remember when I was with you, I was telling you these things? And you do not know what restrains him now, so that in his time he may be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. There are three things that restrain evil. Three things. One is human government. God ordains human government to restrain evil. Even the New Testament tells Christians to pray for the authorities. The early Christians even prayed for the emperors because they know if the emperor wasn't being influenced by God's spirit, he would have been influenced by another spirit. That the gospel may prosper. I don't like politicians too much, but I certainly pray for them because I know if I'm not praying for them, they're going to come under other kinds of influences. They're going to make it bad for us. Now, when the Antichrist comes, human government is given into his hand. Human government is given into his hand. To understand how this happened in the early church, you have to look at emperors like Caligula and stuff who persecuted the church the way they were demon-possessed. Or at the medieval papacy when the government was given into the hands of them. Nonetheless, that goes into his hand. What makes the Great Tribulation unique is this. God is the God of history. But somehow... It says the Antichrist will seek to change the times. For a brief period of three and a half years, equating the ministry of Jesus, the lordship of history will be given into the hands of Satan for a fixed, limited period within certain parameters. But he's saying, you had your chance, now give me my three and a half years. It's something like that. Christians make a mistake of saying the last seven years of history is the Great Tribulation. The Bible calls it the 70th week of Daniel and Hatekufat Hatsorat Yaakov, the time of Jacob's trouble. You can only prove that the second half is the Great Tribulation. There will be tribulation before it, but the second half is much worse. If you want to say the church won't go through the Great Tribulation, that's one thing. But that's not to say they won't enter the last seven years. Neither is it to say that they won't be taken out sometime after the beginning of it. The idea that Jesus can come tomorrow. If I die, God forbid, or you die, God forbid, on the motorway, Jesus came for us tomorrow or tonight. We should always live our lives as if He can come for us, because He can. Whether he comes in a million years or if he comes tonight, it doesn't affect our walk with him because we can die anytime. But the resurrection and the rapture cannot happen until the identity of the Antichrist is revealed to the faithful. Until the man of righteousness is revealed. The first thing that restrains is human government. That's given into his hand. The second thing is the church preaching the gospel. Understand about the metaphor of the night. Jesus said, Work while you fight for night. No man can work. He's coming like sheep in the night. Is he coming in the second watch of the night or in the third watch of the night? The virgins needed oil in their lamps to see in the night. The apostles were rested at night and so was Jesus. That means something. 
In the Song of Solomon, the bridegroom comes for the bride in the night. We have a tape on the Shira Shireen, the Song of Solomon. Matthew 25 took place at Passover time with the wise and foolish virgins. Jesus spoke of Matthew 25 when the Song of Solomon was being read in the synagogues. The Song of Solomon, you know by the gender of the Hebrew text, if it's the bride, the bridegroom, or the Sevaot, the host of heaven, singing the choruses. But it hinges on these two dreams, chapter 3 and chapter 5. In chapter 3, she's ready for the bridegroom, and chapter 5, she's not. When Jesus comes, it's either the church's best dream or worst nightmare. In Judaism, Nisan, the month of Passover, is the month of redemption. That's when the Song of Solomon is read in the synagogues at Passover time. And that's what Jesus was preaching from at Passover in Matthew 25. The wise and foolish virgins replays what was being read in the synagogue that very week. The Song of Solomon. Now, watchman, watchman, how far is the night? He's coming like a thief in the night. Is he coming in the second watch of the night or the third? Work while you have the light, for night will come when no man can work. The night is the most frequent metaphor in the Bible for the Great Tribulation. When Jesus was betrayed, He went outside and it was night. Remember, His last days are like our last days with the betrayal into the Roman authorities. Remember, He was betrayed into the Roman authorities and it was night. It's like us. This night is coming. The Holy Spirit in John 14 convicts the world concerning sin called the Klinktik, he convicts. Somehow, he restrains evil and he empowers the church to preach the gospel and unites the church. God's spirit will not forever strive with man. Pay attention. Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. God's spirit will never leave the hearts of his people. It will not be taken from us but it will be taken from the world. In the book of Revelation, without being a dispensationalist, God goes back to behaving in Revelation the way He did in the Old Testament. Grace, as it were, comes to an end. You understand? You've got a difference between the Spirit indwelling and the Spirit outpoured. The Spirit indwelt in Acts John 20. Jesus breathed on them, Numa in Greek, received the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Hegios, uh, Numus Hegio. Receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit indwelt them. But the Holy Spirit was outpoured on the church on the day of Pentecost. And it empowered them to preach the gospel and began bringing conviction to the world as John 14 said it would. He would convict the world. That will end. In other words, God's Spirit will be the reserve of His people. His, God will never take His Spirit from His people. But His Spirit will no longer convict the world and will no longer empower the church to minister the truth to the world in the way it does now. Grace comes to an end. His mercy becomes for those who are His. He does turn His redemptive attention back towards Israel and the Jews at this period through a great tribulation. Nonetheless, the Holy Spirit will no longer restrain this evil. But that is not to say the church will be removed at the beginning of it. Too many people equate the taking of the church with the taking of the Spirit. That is not true. The Spirit indwells and the Spirit is outpoured. There is a gap between the, ascent, the, the resurrection and the ascension and the day of Pentecost. There was a gap, wasn't there? There was a gap. The Spirit indwelt God's people, but it was not yet poured out and was not convicting the world. The converse happens. Jesus goes and sends the Spirit. The Spirit goes and sends Jesus. You understand? God does not take His Spirit from us, but it is taken from the world. You understand? This period is the Great Tribulation. Satan is no longer restrained and the church is rescued out of it. It does not go through the worst part of it. It says in Job, in six tribulations he will keep us and seven he will deliver us. I'm quite convinced that the removal of the church is between the sixth and seventh seal in Revelation. Be that as it may, let's move on. There are a number of things in the Bible which teach about this period. 
The first is the period between Jesus breathing on the apostles, between the resurrection and the day of Pentecost. Christ had risen, the victory was won, His Spirit indwelt His people. But the church was not empowered to deal with the world. And His Spirit was not restraining the world or convicting the world. That happens again. His Spirit will be for us. It was also the season of betrayal with Judas. We have to understand the church of Smyrna. We have the seven churches on tape from the Greek word myr, what the anointed bodies with. The way the Roman government declared everybody religio licita except Christians, that's going to happen at the end. The government in league with the Antichrist will declare every religion religio licita but come against us. That's another thing that teaches about it. Tribulation. But the third thing is more complicated. We have to understand about Elijah. Whether it's a man or something else, I can't deal with now. We have a separate teaching on it. But Elijah stopped the rain for three and a half years, it says in James, doesn't it? That rain is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit when it stops during the the, the second half of the three and a half years. 1,260 days by the Jewish lunar calendar, two times a time and a half time. But Elijah fed the Gentile woman during that period. Remember? Now look at the story of First Kings. What happens? Jezebel. On the Antichrist tapes, we develop it at length. There are good girls and there are bad girls. Good girls and bad girls. I'm embarrassed to admit I know a fair amount about both. <laughs> Whenever you see a good girl in the Bible, it teaches something about God's woman, Israel or the church in some way. Shulamit in the Song of Solomon, Eve, Rachel, Rivka, Rebecca, Sarah, Mary, Deborah, Yael, Esther. The good women in the Bible all teach something about the bride of Christ from some aspect. Okay? The bad women in the Bible teach something about the spirit of false religion, the bride of Satan. She's personified by Jezebel in Revelation. Certainly, Queen Atliya in the Book of Kings. Her behavior is very much like what Nero's mother did, the way Nero's mother influenced him, and after that he went against the church. Because of her, part of Nero's problem was her negative influence. The same as Queen Atliya in the Book of Kings. All the wicked women of the Bible teach something about this woman. Let's look at Proverbs, please. And we're going to read it midrashically. Now, if you've been in Soho in London, you'll see these ladies dressed up like Stephen Milligan with black mesh stockings and suspenders saying, Good time, dearie. Now, that's totally guttural by British standards, but compared to their sister co-laborers in Manhattan, they're the picture of eloquence. Want to go out? (laughs) I don't suggest the teachings of Proverbs is not about a literal prostitute. It is. But in Midrash, you have a difference between Peshut and Peshut. Pashut is the Peshut. Of course, it's about literal prostitution and adultery and immorality. But the character of this woman woman describes the spirit of false religion. Very briefly, look at Proverbs 31, Solomon's perfect woman. An excellent wife and all this and describes her. She goes to a field like a mission field. She gives food to her household. She considers the field and buys it. She's a delight to her husband. Verse 18, she senses that her gain is good and her... What's it say? Her her lamp does not go out at night. Does that look familiar? Do you understand? That's the good girl. Let's look at some of the bad girls. Who said they're more fun? 
Proverbs 5. They're not more fun, they're deadly. Look at this. My son, give attention to my wisdom. Remember, people without God's wisdom are going to be deceived by false religion. That you may observe discretion and your lips may reserve knowledge. For the lips of an adulteress drip dvash in Hebrew, honey. And smoother than oil is her speech. And oil is what you use to anoint people with. Anointing is one thing, but the devil is very good at counterfeiting anointing. Because how does he do it? Smoothness. These hype artists from America are smooth talkers. They're substituting anointing with hype, and people don't know the difference. But in the end, she's bitter as wormwood. You know, you get this, the poor drunken sailor, right, on payday, and he sees, you know, when he's on his way back from the pub after the last call, and he sees the prostitute, and he goes with her, and then two weeks later, he finds out he's got AIDS or something. It's something like that. That's the kind of metaphor the thing is using. In the end, she's as bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Look at that. The devil can counterfeit God's truth. Remember, the devil in the Old Testament is called Star of the Morning. Jesus is called the Bright and Morning Star. We got this on the Antichrist tapes. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lay hold of Sheol. She does not ponder the path of life. Her ways are unstable and she doesn't know it. Now then, my sons, listen to me. Do not depart from the word of my mouth. Keep your way far from her. Don't go near the door of her house, lest you give your vigor to others and your years to the cool one. The Hebrew is a hezek. You give your strength to the wicked women. Lest strangers be filled with your strength and your hard-earned goods go to the house of an alien. Verse 9 and 10. Who gave his strength to the wicked woman? Delilah is a type of the wicked woman. She seduces God's man into giving his strength. And the way that brought Samson to destruction, but God revived him in victory, that teaches something about the end. You understand? The way that... You know, you can have a guy, a young guy who really loves Jesus and he's a good Christian and he's a good guy, but he's just a sucker for some stupid woman. That can happen to people. But that can also happen to the church, you understand? Spiritual seduction. We have to understand the relationship between idolatry and adultery. Look at this guy smiling, you're not a sucker for... <laughs> <laughs> Idolatry and adultery. Israel's husband was to be Yahweh. The Hebrew word for husband is Baal. The same word as master. Baal Shemaim was Satan. The Canaanite God trying to take God's woman. You understand? The abomination of desolations very quickly is called the Shikutz HaMeshomem in Aramaic. Shikutz comes from the Hebrew word Shekets, meaning slimy reptile or detestable thing. Satan has two modes of attack in Revelation. The serpent and the dragon. The dragon is the persecutor, but the serpent is the seducer. The way the serpent beguiled the woman in the garden is the way Satan tries to deceive the church. Women are much more vulnerable to spiritual seduction than men are. Because they're much more sensitive and God can speak to them easier than He can to men because they're more sensitive. Anything God intends for good, the devil will use for evil. That's why they're more vulnerable to spiritual seduction. God says, let them have their heads covered. Not literally covered, that was the culture. But the practice was, because Eve was vulnerable to spiritual seduction, a woman needs to be under the headship in a protective sense. Women are more sensitive than men. It's usually easier for them to get saved than men. But anything God intends for good, the devil will use for evil. And they're much more vulnerable to spiritual seduction. Let them have their heads covered. Now, in that culture, it meant wearing a headscarf. That's culture-bound. But the principle will be true in any culture. I know a woman always wears a head covered. She's got the biggest mouth you've ever heard in your life. <laughs> if her husband opens his mouth, he gets a smack. And he's a pastor. <laughs> I'm not kidding. A serpent. 
The word shikutsa meshomem, abomination of desolations, the word shekets occurs many places in the Bible. Unfortunately, we usually translate it, your detestable things. O daughter of Zion, you've played the harlot. You've profaned my sanctuary with your detestable things. That word is shekets. Having to do with Satan as a deceiver, but it's almost always applied to Baal worship. Baal is the Hebrew word for husband. The abomination of desolations will have Satan's desire to be God, as you see with the king of Babylon in the Old Testament. He'll use spiritual seduction to take God's woman. You understand? That's what, it, that's what the abomination of desolation means. Satan using spiritual seduction to take God's woman. Israel's husband, Baal was to be Yahweh. But this Baal of Shemaim comes to take his woman. Adultery and idolatry go together. Idolatry equals spiritual adultery. That's why when Israel goes into sin, God says, O daughter of Zion, you've played the harlot, you've gone after other lovers, etc. It uses the language of marital infidelity to explain idolatry. That's what happens. Now let's continue looking at this. Proverbs chapter 7. My son, keep my words and treasure my commandments within you. Keep my commandments and live, and my teaching as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablets of your heart. Say to wisdom, wisdom again, you are my sister. And to understanding, your intimate friend. Remember, in the last days, understanding and faithfulness become closely associated. Why? Because those who don't have it will be vulnerable to deception. What's the next verse say? Why? That they may keep you from an adulteress, from the foreigner who flatters with her words. For at the window of her house, I looked through my lattice, and I saw among the naive. Of my house, I looked out, and I saw the naive. I discerned among the youths a young man lacking sense, passing through the streets near her corner, and he takes the way to her house. When? In the twilight, in the evening. Remember, call the homer. Things that are always true become especially true in the last days. Spiritual seduction has always been around, but it intensifies before Jesus comes. In the middle of the night, and in the darkness, and behold, a woman comes to meet him, dressed as a harlot, cunning of heart. She is boisterous and rebellious. This is just like Revelation and like the book of Nahum. Her feet do not remain at home. She's now on the streets, now on the cor- squares, and works by every corner. She seizes him and kisses him. And with a brazen face, she says to him, I was due to offer peace offerings today that I paid my vows. Therefore, I've come out to meet you, to seek your presence earnestly, and I found you. I've spread my couch with coverings, with colored linens of Egypt. What's Egypt the figure of? I have sprinkled my bed with myrrh. It's a deathbed. Smells nice, but it's a deathbed. They can make a corpse look pretty good. I saw a corpse once. The guy looked ten times better than he did when he was alive. (laughs) But he was dead. What's that Gracie Fields? He's dead, but he won't lie down. (laughs) Come, let us drink our love, a fill of love to morning. Let us delight ourselves with caresses. Now let's read verse 19 and 20. For the man is not at home. Ooh, he's gone on a long journey. He's taken a bag of money with him and at full moon he will come. And she goes on and deceives this guy. She knows the man is not at home. She knows Jesus has gone on a long journey. And at full moon, he will come. What's full moon again? When the moon is reflecting the most light of the sun. The Bible will have to be understood at some point. Despite the darkness, there will be a ray of sun. But those who don't have oil in the lamps, it will be too late for them to go out and buy it. We've got to get the oil now. There's much more than I can say about this, but let me put it to you this way. We've got to understand about Elijah. 
Queen Ahab covets the vineyard. Remember, the Antichrist enters the beautiful land in Daniel. He can't get the vineyard too easily. So Queen Jezebel tries to get possession of the vineyard for Ahab. This brings her into conflict with Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah the prophet. In the last days, the Antichrist wants the vineyard and he goes to the false religious system to get it. This somehow brings a conflict with Elijah. You understand? Now, Elijah, Elisha, Samuel, and John the Baptist are all connected. Midrashically, there are ways to connect things that the church doesn't think of because they're reading a Jewish book with a Greek mind. Whenever you see something happening in the same geographical location in the Bible, there's a midrashic connection between those events. Where does the ministry of John the Baptist take place? On the plain of Jericho. Where does the ministry of Elijah end and the ministry of Elisha begin? The plain of Jericho. You understand? Where is King David from? Where was Jesus from? Bethlehem, the house of bread. Now, Samuel was the last of the judges, but the first of the prophets. John the Baptist was the last figure of the Old Testament, but the first of the New. Remember that. When they looked for somebody to replace Judas, they didn't say somebody who was with us, with Jesus from the beginning. They said, we have to find somebody who was with us from John. John was the pivotal figure. He was transitional. The New Testament era begins with John, not Jesus. You understand? Now, John and Samuel had similar circumstances surrounding their birth. Whenever you see similar circumstances surrounding a birth, there's a Madrasha connection. Wherever you see people born super, under supernatural circumstances. What was it, Hannah and the parents of John the Baptist? There's always a connection. But Elijah, Elisha, and John had the same spirit, didn't they? So the wicked woman turns the king against Elijah. And what happens with Herodias and King Herod? The wicked woman turns the king against Elijah. Remember, it's a pattern. The same things happen again and again. The way the wicked woman turned the king against Elijah, that's what happens with John, and that's somehow what happens when Elijah comes again. You understand? Now there's a lot more I can say about this, but it's complicated. Very complicated. <laughs> Pay attention. Let's look at the book of Amos. <laughs> Chapter 8, verse 11. Days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine on the land. <clears throat> Not a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but rather for hearing of the Word of God. Remember, the physical reflects the spiritual. When the temple veil was torn, the physical thing reflected a spiritual one, right? Jesus said there'll be famines in the last days. But the physical famines in the last days are only a reflection of a spiritual one. You understand? There'd been no prophet in Israel for over 400 years. And John the Baptist comes in the spirit of Elijah and feeds God's people in the famine and prepares for the Messiah to come. There's going to be a famine in the end. But somehow, in the spirit of Elijah, God's people are going to be fed and prepared for the Messiah to come. The way that Elijah stopped the rain is the Holy Spirit stopping for three and a half years. The Maim Hayim, the outpouring, stops. But he feeds the Gentile woman, doesn't he? Supernaturally. She's a type of the church. Gentile women, like Queen of Sheba, are types of the church. Remember Jesus said, Malki Sheva, the Queen of Sheba, came to hear the wisdom of Solomon? Whenever you say Gentile women who are good, good Gentile women are types of the Gentile church. Now, similarly in the, the story of Deborah with Yael and that. 
Now, God's people get fed in this famine. I wish we could deal with the typology of the temple. You have to have the typology of the calendar. But you've got these outpourings of rain and these harvests. Can't go into it now. But the thing is this. A Jew reading Revelation chapters 10 and 11 would have said it's a Midrash on Joshua. You've got the same numerical pattern. The seven seals, but the seventh of the seven seals has seven trumpets, a numerical subset. Now those trumpets correspond to the Feast of Trumpets and what that means in the prophetic calendar. It corresponds to the last, it connects with the last trumpet, the trumpet that's blown on Yom Kippur. All these things fit together. I can't go into it now. But the last trumpet and, and when Christ descends, etc. However, you've got the seven, and the seven seven has a subset of seven, right? Then there's silence in heaven for a half hour. For me, that may be the most confusing verse in the Bible how can you apply a human measurement of time to something in eternity I don't understand that verse maybe I partly understand part of it but then these two spies these two witnesses that you see in Zechariah are manifested aren't they then they blow the last trumpet and it says this kingdom has become the kingdom of our God and his Messiah what happens in the story of Jericho? They march around seven times, but the seventh day, they had to do it seven times. So you got the same numerical pattern. Seven, but the seven seven has a subset of seven. You understand? It's like, a, like an equation. Silence in heaven, the Levites had to be totally quiet, didn't they? Somehow, those two spies were sent to rescue the Gentile woman before the judgment came. They prefigure the ministry of the two witnesses in Revelation. Do you understand? And then they blow the last trumpet, and this city's been given to us by the Lord. They blow the last trumpet in Revelation, this city's been given to us by this world's become the kingdom. It's a midrashic replay. Midrashically, it replays the text of Joshua. You won't find that in any commentary that I know of. Because they're all written by people who have Greek minds. They've studied in the best theological cemeteries in the world. I mean seminaries in the world. <laughs> now, Elijah feeds the people like John did. Moses fed the children of Israel to prepare them for the exodus out of Egypt. You understand? Joseph fed the whole world, didn't he? But there was a Passover meal, Joseph, Moses fed the whole world, fed, fed all the children of Israel to prepare them to leave. Which again is a type of the resurrection and rapture, isn't it? They bring Joseph's bones, those same judgments in Revelation, replay the Exodus, and there's darkness, but only the Jews had lights in the house because they were eating the Passover. Before Jesus faced his last days, what did he do? He fed his disciples and prepared them for what was coming. Before Paul in Acts 20 leaves for his last days, what happens? He meets in the upper room, breaks bread, and feeds the disciples. And it says in Acts 20, what does it say? There were many lamps in the room. The eye is the lamp of the body. If the eye is sound, the body will be sound also. Ministry of teaching. Referring to Ze in Zephaniah chapter 1, alluding to the Jewish Passover, when you search the house for leaven, it says in Zephaniah, I will search Jerusalem with lamps, purging leaven. Leaven is a figure of sin in the Bible in 1 Corinthians 5. Jews had to get all the leaven out of the house before they could eat the Passover. The same as we're supposed to get rid of the leaven in our lives before we come to the Lord's table. Once again, the old-time brethren have a much more biblical and a much more Jewish understanding of the Lord's Supper than the rest of Christians do. Much better. 
Now, I will search Jerusalem with lamps. There will be a purging of the leaven from Zion for right teaching in the last days before Jesus comes. The eye is the lamp of the body. Think of the armor in Ephesians quoted from Isaiah. How lovely on the mountain are the feet of him who brings good news in Isaiah 52, right? And in Nahum. Put on the shoes of the gospel of peace. The church is a body. Its feet are its evangelists, right? Put on the shoes. I love you on the mountain of the feet of him. But the eye is the lamp of the body. It's the teacher, the one who sees, who gives the light. You understand? Paul says he's feeding the church and there were many lamps in the place. Somehow the ministry of Elijah is going to put the oil into the lamps of, of, of the teachers. You understand? Somehow. Jesus fed the apostles and then they took the bread when he fed the 5,000 and he fed the people in groups of 50. 50 is the number of the Holy Spirit, isn't it? Pentecost. The sons of the prophets, the same. Elijah fed them through Obadiah in groups of 50. Somehow, it'll come from one source, but be broken down and then go to other groups. You understand? Somehow, it's going to happen like that. I don't fully understand it, but that's the pattern. The same as we'll see in Acts 27. Paul fed the people on the boat. We'll come to that. Elijah is going to feed the other teachers. Whoever Elijah is, or however you understand it, whether it's a man, a movement, two people, I'm not going to go into that. I only partly understand it. And will only teach something definitively once I understand it. The Holy Spirit hasn't shown me, and I'm not... Let few of you be teachers, it says in James. God's going to hold me more accountable than He's holding you. So I, I'm not going to teach something doctrinally until I'm sure God's shown it to me. I'm not going to speculate about Elijah. I'm just going to tell you what I know, what I know, what I do know that God has shown me, alright? Somehow, He will break the famine. Somehow he will do it. And he'll, he'll be the one, his, what he's got is going to filter through others to the church at large. The Maccabees are similar. In, in Daniel 11, those who have understanding among the people will give insight to the many. Very similarly. They'll understand the deception. The important thing is in Proverbs you saw the woman had this truth that was sharper than a two-edged sword and she was smoother than oil. You understand? The nature of seduction. If people don't have God's wisdom, they're going to be vulnerable. Because we have a two-edged sword, something sharper than a two-edged sword. They're going to have something sharper than a two-edged sword. We're going to have the oil of anointing. They're going to have something even smoother. Not better. Not better. But a counterfeit. A counterfeit diamond. If you don't have a professional eye, you can't tell the difference. Unless you're in the trade, some diamonds, counterfeit diamonds, they're worthless. They're made out of polished glass, but they can look so real that only a jeweler can tell the difference. And there's even diamonds that are such high quality reproductions that even the experts have a hard time telling the difference initially. They have to do all kinds of cauterization tests and stuff. You understand? If Christians today are sucked in by things obviously erroneous, if they're sucked in by a guy like Rick Godwin who says that Matthew 24 is not about the last days and they'll all go clap for this guy or they're sucked in by Paul Kane or, what are they going to do when this stuff happens? If you can't stand in a land of dryness if you can't stand in the dry land how will you persevere in the thicket of the Jordan when, when it gets overrun with the flood season the wadis? If people get sucked in by this stuff this name it and claim it stuff and all the craziness. What are they going to do when the real deception comes? There is going to be a schism in the last days within the church. And there's going to be a number of things that are going to divide the church. One of which is going to be the churches that compromise and the ones who don't. Another thing you watch is going to be Israel. Is the role and place of God's purpose and calling for Israel is going to be another thing that divides the church. But a third thing is going to be the authority of Scripture and the way it's interpreted. There's going to be a division. And those will be three of the key issues. There may be others, but those are going to be three of the issues that are going to divide.
What happens with Elijah teaches about this tribulation. Another thing is so it will be in the days of Noah. Now in Peter's epistle, it describes the problem of Noah from one angle. Noah, a preacher of righteousness, was warning people and they wouldn't listen until it was too late. Right? That's the message of Noah for unsaved people. What's it say in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 and 10? The Lord is not slow, as some count slowness, but wanting none to perish. All should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, when the heavens, when the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and the works that are upon it will be burned up. I don't know how you make it, what you make out of it, but before Mr. Einstein and Mr. Oppenheimer, nobody knew about subatomic particles in the sense of an atom being divided and getting explosive energy from it. The Greek word is stoichia. We get the word stoichiometry, elements. Long before subatomic physics or particle physics, long before anyone thought about splitting an atom, a fisherman from Galilee not only said it's possible to split an atom, but it's possible to get enough explosive energy to destroy the whole world that way. That's exactly what it says in Greek. 2 Peter 3. Now, Peter is warning the days of Noah for the unsaved. They didn't listen to Noah till it was too late, and unsaved people won't listen to us till it's too late. Boats are a type of the church. We'll come to this in the last session. Noah's Ark, even its dimensions, the 50 is the number of the Holy Spirit, the 30 cubits is the number of spiritual maturity, like David began his king when he was 30, and, and Jesus began his ministry when he was 30, etc. And pitching it within and without, all this stuff means something. Nonetheless, that's for the unsaved. They're not going to listen. They're going to be going crazy with their sin and immorality and won't listen. And only a remnant are preserved. Those who are on the ark, which is the church. But Jesus warns about the days of Noah from another aspect. I only do this under this condition. I never do this anywhere else dealing with any other subject because I think it's American hype and manipulation. But I make an exception now. What does Jesus say in Matthew 24? So in the days of Noah, there will be eating and drinking, given in marriage and being given in marriage. The unsaved have to be warned about immorality. Christians have to be warned about being hung up on temporal things. There's nothing wrong with eating. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with drinking. Brother Ed sells non-alcoholic wine from Israel. You can go into there and you can see all the bottles of non-alcoholic wine from Israel neatly set up on the table. Don't ask him what he's got under the table. <laughs> <laughs> Men will be eating and drinking, given in marriage and being given in marriage. The danger in the last days is that Christians be caught become caught up in temporal things. This is the only time I ever do this because it's American hype when it's usually done and I don't want to be identified with that but I'll do it this time. Everybody repeat after me. The things that are for here are not the things that we are here for. The things that are for here are not the things that we are here for. There is nothing wrong with getting married or going to a restaurant. But when those things become the focus and center of where you're at, you have a problem. You're not going to be ready for Jesus to come. But not only that, the danger is ministry becoming an idol. People building their empires instead of the kingdom of God. Let he who was in the field, the mission field, not go back for his cloak. I'll make you fishes of men, Jesus said. Now think about it, they fished all night and caught nothing till Jesus told them where to cast their nets. Fishing is a type of evangelism. And that's the way it happens. When Jesus directs our evangelism, they had to call people in another boat to come help them. When revival breaks out in one church, it spreads to another. You understand? But when Peter is fishing and the call goes up, he does something very peculiar. Normally, if you want to go swimming, you pull your shirt off and dive in the water. Peter puts his on. Because his shirt is a type of the garments of salvation in Isaiah and in Revelation. You understand? And he dives off as soon as it says, 
It is the Lord. Remember in the end of John, it is the Lord, and he dives immediately, puts the thing on and dives, gets his cloak, the garments of salvation, and goes to be with Jesus. He was fishing. In figure, he was doing his ministry. But as soon as Jesus comes, forget the ministry, Jesus is first. There's a danger that even the ministry can be an idol and more important to Jesus in the last days. You understand? Even ministries can be an idol. He's got to be first. I wish more Christians thought about that. I need to think about it a lot. It's a danger. It is the Lord and He goes to be with... Think of American basketball. We got these black people in America who play basketball almost like they're superhuman. It's unbelievable how good they are. I can't believe how good these people are at playing basketball. It doesn't matter to them if there are two hours on the clock to play the game or if there is 30 seconds. They play with such energy and vigor and concentration that even though there is 10 seconds left in the game, they know that can make the difference. And as far as they're concerned, there's an hour left in the game. You understand? But as soon as that buzzer goes off, that's it. That's the way we should be. Totally intent on what we're doing. It doesn't matter if there's three days before Jesus comes or 300 years. We should be playing the game the same way. With the same concentration, the same vigor, the same intensity. But as soon as the buzzer goes off, that's it. It's always 10 minutes to midnight. You know in John's epistle where it says it's the last hour. The idea in Greek is time freezes. Israel is God's timepiece for the nations. Pay attention. Why did the early Christians say it was the last days? Let me explain. One day Howard was watching rugby on television. And Susan said, when do you want your dinner? And it was 10 minutes to 6. And he said, I want my dinner in 10 minutes when the rugby game is over. The game will be over at 6 o'clock. So Susan puts his dinner in the microwave, pushes the buttons, and all of a sudden at 10 to 6, there's an injury on the rugby field. (laughs) And they stop the clock. And the medics come out and say, we can't move this guy, we've got to get a doctor. And then the doctor comes and says, we've got to have an ambulance, we have to move him a certain way, we can't do anything about it. How many minutes left in the game? Well, 10. Yeah, but 10 minutes ago there was 10 minutes. Yeah, but the ambulance is stuck in traffic. What do you want me to do about it? It's always 10 minutes left in the game. You understand? But at any time, the clock can begin again as soon as this guy is removed. So now it's 6 o'clock and Susan tells Howard, Howard, your dinner's ready. It's getting cold. You said you want it in 10 minutes. The game will be over in 10 minutes. That was 10 minutes ago. Here's your dinner. I said, yeah, I know. But something went wrong. I said, well, how much more time left in the game? Susan asked him. I'll keep it warm for you. I'll put it back in the microwave. And she said, he says, well, there's 10 minutes left in the game. Yeah, but you said there was 10 minutes 10 minutes ago. You understand? That's the time of the Gentiles. It's Israel that's God's timepiece. Nebuchadnezzar represents many things in the Bible. Many things. He's a very interested and complicated figure in Scripture. The seven churches in Revelation were seven churches that literally existed throughout his, in, in the first century. There are also seven types of churches which can exist generally, especially in the last days before Revelation 4, before the main part of the vision. But they also correspond, I'm convinced, to four overlapping periods of church history. I have it on tape. The history of the church. The, 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 the Greek names of those churches mean something. Ephesus is not lasting. Smyrna is the one that's persecuted, anointed for burial. (coughs) Pergamon is divorced when the adultery comes in with Constantine. Thyatira is continuing sacrifice, the Roman Catholic doctrine of the Mass, etc. You get the tapes if you're interested. Nonetheless, those seven periods, then we go to Revelation 4, and these things happen, the main part of the vision. Nebuchadnezzar, he's cut down, and an iron collar is put around him. And it says, for seven periods, that iron collar is kept on him to prevent him from blossoming. 
but the end of seven periods, the collar is removed and he blossoms again. It's the same idea. The age of the church occurs, to the best of my understanding, between the 69th and 70th week of Daniel. Somehow the age of the Gentiles comes to a close, as it says in Luke 21, 24, and Romans 11, and then the clock begins again. There's always ten minutes left in the game. Time is frozen, you understand? But Israel is God's timepiece. A bit complicated. Now, it's always the last days. Jesus can come. So concerning the days of Noah, we have to warn the unsaved about their immorality, but we have to warn ourselves about becoming attached to this life. Okay? But now, when you want to understand the days of Noah, you have to go back and read the story of Noah. When I was a young Christian, we used to, I was a Jesus freak, hippies, we got saved out of the drug culture. We used to witness eight hours a day sometimes, because we thought Jesus was coming next week anyway, so what else mattered? I met so many people who told me that their beliefs were based on gods on other planets. And fly UFOs in this. When the American president, Carter, became president, he declassified something called the Blue Report, put together by the American Air Force, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, and the Central Intelligence Agency. It was not all declassified, but Carter declassified a major portion of it. They found no evidence with exobiology of extraterrestrial life. But they had innumerable cases of people using parapsychology to conjure up extraterrestrial phenomena, even making cultists who are able to make these things appear. Recorded in U.S. government documents, pictures of American fighter planes chasing these things in all sorts. Similar studies were done in Great Britain. Quite frightening when you read the Blue Report. No scientific basis, only a, but a firmly recorded basis in the occult. Yuri Geller, the Israeli spoonbender, says there's people on other planets trying to persuade him to be the Messiah says that. Uh, the Niflim, the fallen ones, strange characters, whether they are, it would appear they survived the flood, whether the Nephilim who were in the land of Canaan when the Jews came are a different Nephilim or different Geborim, the great ones, than the ones before the flood, theologians are divided, they're not sure. Some say they're the same, some say they're different. If they're the same, it would mean they somehow survived the deluge if they are the same. Theologians are divided. Nonetheless, these things are the fallen ones, and we're told in the scriptures they copulated with human women. I once cast a demon out of a black necromancer. Uh, now, all these people going around with the deliverance, casting demons out in the spirit of this, most of it's a lot of just ghostbusters. It's a lot of nonsense with no biblical basis. I would seriously question if many of the people caught up in this stuff, if they faced real demon possession, if they'd be able to handle it. It's no joke. But we had a black necromancer, a black necromancer who was having sexual relations with demons. There was a witch in England on television in America who gave her testimony when she got saved and she talked about having intercourse with the devil and people witnessed it. This kind of activity was what was around in the days of Noah and it will happen in the last days. Somehow, demonoids, they were virtual monsters. Jesus said it was in the days of Noah, it'll be again. You're going to see an increase in occult activity, but particularly this kind of high Satanism. And even to the point of people having relations with demons. It already goes on, but it's going to increase. It's easy. See, man is utterly fallen. I studied science in university. I have no problem with science. I wouldn't have any problem with science. I studied it myself as a kid in university. But, man is fallen. While I have no problem with science, I know what happens when you put science into the hands of fallen man. It's easy to see with biogenetic engineering, people can take a, the, the, the DNA and eventually clone it and recreate Joseph Stalin or a whole race of Joseph Stalins. These ideas, there are things happening right now in genetics that when I was in university, I studied biology, it would have seemed like science fiction. It no longer is. I have no doubt, I met the guy while I talked to him, I used to be in the pop music business, David Bowie, these albums he puts out, Ziggy Stardust and Scary Monsters and stuff, the Spielberg movies, 
about the, the, the UFOs and all this stuff, and ET, I have no doubt, I'm, I'm, I'm not teaching it doctrinally, it's my opinion, but I have no doubt that, that the world is being set up for a spiritual seduction on which these kinds of things will very likely have a role. The Bible talks about the fallen ones, they fell from the heavens, the Nephilim. The cosmos needs to be cleansed. The spiritual seduction that's coming, I'm very convinced that extraterrestrial phenomena and things like this will likely, likely have a role in the deception that's being perpetrated. I'm also quite afraid of the developments in biogenetic engineering. Not the developments themselves, but that kind of technology in the hands of fallen man. I'm quite afraid. When it's combined with the occult, which Scientology and these other groups are already doing, the ramifications are terrible. Now somehow you had a physical manifestation of demons in the days of Noah. That kind of stuff is going to happen before Jesus comes in some way. I don't want to speculate about it, but I just see the way things are going. This is the kind of world that we have to raise our children to prepare for. And you think about that and tell me you don't believe in Christian schools. But let's continue. Smyrna, the days of Elijah, the days of Noah, all teach about the tribulation in some way. So does Sodom, the sins of Sodom. When you see Jerusalem surrounded, Jesus said, under the leadership of Simeon, who was the cousin of Jesus, who replaced the Apostle James when James was martyred, the believers left Jerusalem for a place called Pila, not Petra, Pila. The believers thought that was the rapture of the church in 70 AD. When the Romans withdrew, you read about it in Josephus, and they were rescued, they thought Jesus was coming. Now it's a major type of the rapture. That teaches what will happen at the end. Nonetheless, the idea of being surrounded, God's people being rescued, and the destruction coming. That's what happened in the fall of Samaria, 720. It's what happened in the fall of Jerusalem. And it's what happened in the fall of Jerusalem again, on the same day, to Shabbat Av in 70 AD under the Romans. The idea is God's people being rescued, but the judgment following. Somehow those two angels that rescued Lot's family correspond to the two spies sent into Jericho to rescue Rahab and the two witnesses in Revelation. They all teach the same idea in some way. You understand? It fits. They thought the destruction of Sodom was the end of the world, didn't they? Lot's daughters. And the way his wife turned around and faced Sodom is like what Jesus said, don't turn back when the flight comes. You understand? Don't hold on to this world. Not only that, but Lot represents a weak believer. Jesus was like, represented by Abraham, who was interceding for Lot. Remember? But somehow, things get so bad in Sodom and Gomorrah, if you find 50, if you find 40, if you find 30, if you find 20, if you find 10, salt preserves. Once the salt stops preserving and the light stops being light, God will only intervene for those who are truly His and judgment falls. You understand? But those who are truly His, the church in the last days, will the Son of Man find faith on earth? In the last days, even the true believers have a lot of problems. Lot is a good example. He was a weak believer in many respects. He was relatively comfortable in such an evil place, wasn't he? Up to a point. Isaiah 28 is one of the most important chapters of the Old Testament in teaching about the last days. And it talks about the message of the end. And it says it's sheer terror to understand what it means. When the deep meaning of Scripture is revealed, it's going to be sheer terror. Habakkuk, when Habakkuk saw the future, what he saw was so frightening, he asked God to change the future, and God told him no. Something terrible is going to happen. But God will intervene for those who are truly His. Now remember Lot's sons. It's his son-in-laws. When they were being warned, they didn't take Lot seriously, did they? Remember? So his sons were not, son-in-laws were not rescued. 
He leaves, his daughters leave, and his wife leaves, and she's being rescued, but she looks back. Jesus is coming for fervent believers, for those who want Him to come, for those who aren't holding on to this world. Those are the ones who will be rescued from Sodom once again. And these sins of Sodom are evil. A baby is the ultimate emblem of God's love. Even unsaved people see that. If you have a baby, your firstborn baby, and God forbid that baby is in bad health and is facing death, the baby's parents would willingly give their own lives so that baby can live, right? God created that kind of love to teach how much He loves us. That's why Jesus gave His life that we could live. The kind of love that we have for our own babies, God creates that kind of love to teach how much He loves us. Okay? Including that your parent would lay its own life down for the baby. The baby might drive the parent nuts. It might, you know, be colicky and the rest of it, but it's still my baby and I'll die for it. God creates that kind of love to teach about His love for us. When Israel went too far was when they sacrificed their babies to, to demons, the Molech, these other gods. In modern society, if you were to take all of the clinical reasons for abortion and put them together, if you were to take ectopic pregnancy, vaginal cancer, radio-induced mutagenesis of a fetus, uh, you know, congenital birth defects during gestation due to radiation exposure. If you were to take all of the clinical reasons for abortion and put them together, they would only account for a small percentage of the abortions performed in the United Kingdom or the United States or any other Western country. Most abortions are performed for non-therapeutic reasons, in other words, for social and economic considerations. Jesus called this mammon worship. Make no mistake about it, non-therapeutic abortion is theologically and spiritually related to demon worship. God judged Israel for it, and God is going to judge America and Great Britain for it. That in itself, when you take these ultimate emblems of God's love and sacrifice them to demons, that's where God draws the line. We'll come back to this in a moment. Similarly, the sins of Sodom. You have to understand the theology of human sex. The husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Sex in a Christian marriage is a reflection of Jesus going inside of his bride, causing his bride to be fruitful. You understand? That doesn't mean that marital love, that are, uh, sexual love in marriage, it doesn't mean it's not erotic, it doesn't mean it's not a good time. What it does mean is that it's holy. God comes together in Himself in an act of created love, creative love in Genesis and brings forth the creation. A plural God comes together, in the Hebrew word is achad, achdut, oneness, in Himself and makes the creation. He makes us in His image and likeness. So when male and female procreate in His love, we are replaying, it's imagio dehi, we're replaying the creation, you understand? He's creative, so He makes us procreative because we're made in His image. Human sex, as God intended it, has a deep spiritual significance. Going back to the God's relationship with His triune self and with Christ's relationship with the church. A clear mark of Satan is he always be the opposite of God. So in God's design for human sexuality, it is giving and receiving pleasure. And it is heterosexual. Okay? The two biggest forms of sexual perversion in the world today are undoubtedly homosexuality and sadomasochism. Both of those things bear the clear signature of Satan because they're the principle of opposites. Instead of it being heterosexual, it becomes homosexual. And instead of it being giving and receiving pleasure, it becomes giving and receiving pain. I'm not talking about married couples. It's wrong to enjoy aggressive sex or whatever. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the perversion. The, 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 you, know, you need this. The pop singer Madonna, she was interviewed about a year ago in Time or Newsweek magazine. I read it. And she put out a video of some kind about sex or something. 
And a lot of it was sadomasochism, and it was her being whipped and all this stuff, and some of this, this, something like this. And they asked her about it. And they asked her why she got off on this, why she found this sexually appealing. And she said, I like being uh, humiliated and, and punished by a strict male authority figure because of my Roman Catholic upbringing. <laughs> she was right in a way. You know, if you, if you know Roman Catholicism, she's right, because Roman Catholicism puts this guilt into people. Once again, it denies the cross, and the cross takes away the guilt, so because Roman Catholics deny the cross with the doctrine of the Mass, Jesus has to die again, the Roman Catholics have this deep guilt thing. You very often see, after Roman Catholics get saved, they still have this guilt thing that takes them a while to grow out of. A blossoming of sadomasochism and a blossoming of homosexuality. About three weeks ago in London, a lesbian headmistress of a school refused to let the kids in the school go on a class trip to see Romeo and Juliet because it was blatantly heterosexual. You see what I'm saying? That's the last days of Sodom. That's the last days of England. That's the last days of America. Judgment begins in the house of God in these Christianized countries. And you look where it's happened, Hollywood. The riots, the, the earthquakes, the landslides, and the forest fires, it's Hollywood, Malibu. God judged Israel for these things, and He's going to judge the West for them. Now I'll tell you something, we're more guilty than Israel is, but that's another story. We have much more. Finally, and we'll take a break after this, we have to understand this idea. The Bible says fallen is Babylon, right? It takes the themes of Jeremiah and Isaiah about fallen is Babylon and uses them in Revelation. It also takes the themes of Daniel about the temple being destroyed. <coughs> Matthew 24 is about that. What happened? Daniel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, those were the prophets leading up to and during the Babylonian captivity. Okay? What happened in Israel during that time, leading up to and during the captivity, is a type of what happens at the end of the world. That's why Revelation, Matthew 24, takes those themes. Fallen is Babylon, the temple being destroyed, and most of all, the false prophets over and over from Jeremiah. It takes those same themes and recycles them for the last days, for both Israel and the church in different ways. Very quickly, let's look at Jeremiah chapter 5. <coughs> Verse 30. An appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. And the priests rule on their own authority. And my people love it so. But what will you do in the end? The prophets prophesy falsely, the leaders lead on their own authority, and God's people love it. After Paul, Cain, and Wimber made these false predictions, the same people will get on the same buses and go hear them again. Jeremiah was warning about God's judgment coming against their nation. Look at verse 27. Therefore, they become great and rich. They thought, like Laodicea, because they were materially well off, they were blessed by God and in His favor, and didn't want to recognize judgment was just around the corner. That is the church. That is Laodicea. Jeremiah was telling the truth. God's judgment is coming. We have to repent. They were saying, no, no, no. We are rich. God wants us rich. He was saying, God's judgment is coming. They were saying, no, no, no. The kingdom of the Lord, the kingdom of the Lord. It's the same thing today with the faith prosperity preachers and the restorationists. The prophets prophesy falsely, and my people love it so. Doesn't say they're not his people. Look at Jeremiah 28. Hananiah makes these wild predictions that fail to happen. Just like the Kansas City false prophets. But at verse 15, then Jeremiah the prophet said to Hananiah the prophet, doesn't say he's not a prophet. Listen now, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you, and you've made this people trust in a lie. 
Therefore, thus says the Lord, I'm going to remove you from the face of the earth. You've made God's people trust in a lie, Mr. Wimber. You've made God's people trust in a lie, Bob Jones. You've made God's people trust in a lie, Paul Cain. They did it. It's a fact. You can see the videos. You can read the books. Read Equipping the Saints. They did the same thing. That's what happened then. And that's what Jesus said is going to happen before he comes. And that's exactly what is going on. These people are Gnostics. And they're also ecumenical. They are also ecumenical. It's okay to be a Roman Catholic and pray to the dead. God says it's an abomination, but that's all right. What happens in the Babylonian captivity and leading up to it is a major type of what happens to the church in the last days. Sodom and Gomorrah, the period of Elijah and his conflict with Jezebel and Ahab. The age of the church of Smyrna, the days of Noah, and the last days of Israel and Samaria prior to their captivities. And again, it was the sacrificing babies to demons that caused God's judgment to fall before the Babylonian captivity. And I have no doubt that non-therapeutic abortion is going to be the impetus for God's judgment on the West. Similarly, when the society was falling to bits and the hallmarks of God's impending judgment were all over, people were running around saying, we're rich, God wants us rich, we're triumphant, we're the king's kids, Jeremiah, you're a false prophet. And it's the same today. The hallmarks of God's judgment are all over the place. The society is falling to bits. Everything's falling to bits. The crime rate has gone up one-third in the last five years. And we have people running around saying, we're the king's kids, God wants us rich, we're the church triumphant, and the rest of it. And again, what Jesus warned over and over the false prophets deceiving the elect. There was a book called The Harvest by someone called Rick Joyner. The man actually predicted a blossoming of communism throughout the developing world, which would take over the entire developing world and part of the United States and various other major areas of the West. This communism was going to have this blossoming. He predicted this in the name of the Lord in the book The Harvest. He's another one of the Kansas City crowd. The exact opposite happened. The exact opposite. And yet people will go follow these people as their prophets. The prophets prophesy falsely and my people love it. Whenever you read the history of Kings and Chronicles and Jeremiah and Isaiah, the events leading up to the captivity, that teaches about the end. Now remember in Proverbs about showing your treasures. Remember it said that in Proverbs? That verse? Let's look at it. Proverbs chapter 5 And your hard-earned goods go to the house of an alien. Proverbs 5.10 King Hezekiah showed his treasures to the king of Babylon. You're going to have a blossoming of Babylon, the false religious system in the last days, once the treasures from the house of the Lord. When you find evangelicals who are ecumenical, people like John Wimber, people like George Carey, People like Michael Harper. These people are showing our treasures to the king of Babylon. Those treasures are going to be plundered by the king of Babylon. What happened before the captivity and what caused the captivity to happen? The, the sacrificing the babies, the showing your treasures to the king of Babylon, following false prophets instead of listening to the true ones thinking that God wants us rich and because we're rich we've got it made. This is the same thing that preceded it. All of this Gnosticism, that's the way I was taught to pronounce it anyway. I, my, my, actually my Greek teacher was from Greece. Gnosos. I can only read Greek, I can't speak it. I'm trying to learn Scouse. <laughs> All these things are based on elitism, spiritual pride. You know what I'm saying? They're all based on spiritual pride. All of these things. Now be very careful about this. I got a letter about two months ago, six weeks ago, from Roger Foster. He didn't like the fact that I challenged him on his annihilationism. That there was no eternal hell. And I showed him the Greek term, enyon, ton enyon, 
forever and ever, etc. It's the same term used for God's glory, the high priesthood of Jesus, and our salvation. Hence, if the torment in the lake of fire is not forever and ever, neither is the glory of Jesus, the high priesthood of Jesus, or our salvation. If there's no eternal hell, which is a conscious damnation, you can't prove it from the Bible. As soon as you begin telling unsaved people that if they don't repent and accept Jesus, when they die, they're not going to exist anymore, they're going to say, so what? That's what we believe anyway. Now, unfortunately, that's the theology in back of the March for Jesus. That's what Graham Kendrick, Ichthys, Roger Forster believe. People don't realize that. I like the ideas of Christians standing together, proclaiming Jesus, and preaching the gospel. But in Dominion theology, proclamation into the heavenlies replaces evangelism. Speaking it into the heavenlies replaces... <laughs> proclaiming it into the heavenlies becomes a replacement for proclaiming the gospel to the lost. You understand? We proclaim, we're marching on the ground, we're going to claim the land. But this, that's, the, that's the exact mentality in back of it. And again, you know, this proclamation of we proclaim, we take dominion. If you look at the hymns of Graham Kendrick, that's what you've all got. All this kind of thing. We'll march on the land, claim the ground, we claim. Now the man is a very talented hymn writer. Probably the best since Charles Wesley, many people would say. The problem is this. When you deal with Gnosticism, Gnostics or people influenced by Gnosticism will always mean different things than you do by the same terms. Let me explain. A Roman Catholic and Protestant theologian will have an ecumenical dialogue at a theological forum. And the Protestant guy will say, we're saved by grace. And the Jesuit will say, yes, we're saved by grace. Oh, in that case, the Reformation was a mistake. We both agree. However, the Hebrew word for grace is chesed. It's God's mercy in the covenant. The Greek word is charism, meaning gift. The English word is undeserved favor, from the Latin gracia, right? So you're thinking about God's mercy, God's undeserved favor, you're thinking about God's gift. That's how you understand grace when you say we're saved by grace. To a Roman Catholic, grace is an ethereal substance earned by the sacraments administered by a priest. So they can both agree we're saved by grace, except that they have two different definitions of grace, you understand? When you witness to somebody in the New Age movement and you give them your testimony, you're going to tell them, I saw the light. You are thinking of the true light that came into the world, John chapter 1. They'll say, I saw the light. Only they mean an illumination of cosmic consciousness. You can both say we saw the light when you give your respective testimonies, but you have two different definitions of light. When restorationists and Kingdom Now people use terms like victory, kingdom, triumph, dominion, proclamation, they mean different things by those terms than you do. They use biblical terms in an unbiblical way. The same as a Roman Catholic will or the same as a New Ager will. Indeed, Roman Catholicism, Gnosticism, and Restorationism all come from the same place, Alexandria. They all have roots in that theology. You understand what I'm saying? Now we've got to talk about the idea of the temple. Jesus begins talking about the end of the world in Matthew 24 by discussing the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, doesn't he? But Jesus says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. He was talking about his body. Okay?